Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. With the guests on my podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technological discovery you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Rune Oskart. He's a Norwegian lawyer with 25 years of experience and an author. Two of his books, Fraudcoin and Unbar, are currently the most popular books in Norway in the economics category. And his next book, Arrow of Truth, will launch very soon. Rune's mission is to write and talk about the forgotten right to use the money we like best, which is monetary freedom, and how history teaches us that we always must fight against monopolies in money production. I'm excited to talk with him today. So uh, welcome, Rune. Thank you for having me, Bram. Nice to be with you. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on. I love to talk with people that I just know from uh, from the internet and also I think very cool to see you know you have a long career being being a lawyer you know I think this is a, a big team in Bitcoin that lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds you know start moving their energy towards Bitcoin and I think uh, with you it's the same so very uh, very interesting to see um, I have a lot of questions about inflation thought it was, would be a nice topic to talk about. But first, I wanted to start with uh, like a new segment that I want to introduce in the podcast, which is, you know, what is, an, what is an interesting tweet, article, podcast, or video that you've come across recently that you love to share with the audience? Any content that uh, caught your eye? Oh... I read so much uh, on Twitter X these days, but it's a it's a while ago since I listened to anything on uh, any podcast. No, I I listened to an episode uh, on uh, what Bitcoin did the other day. It was from uh, uh, the Cheat Code conference uh, that uh, Peter McCormack uh, McCormack McCormack uh, hosted. I think it was a talk first with. Um, Lynn Alden and then a couple of other guys. It, that was a great episode. I would highly recommend that. Yeah, nice. Really high signal. So, hmm. all right. Well, if you share it with me, I'll link to it in the show notes, and then uh, you know we uh-huh. can point people towards other content that's uh, that's worth checking out. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about your book. It's called Fraud Coin: a Thousand A Thousand Years with Inflation as a Policy. Um, there are basically two different like economic schools of thought and they talk differently about inflation so we have keynesian economics that i think a lot of people that are into bitcoin or exploring bitcoin have heard about you know they view moderate inflation as something that's beneficial that drives demand that produces unemployment that kind of like fuels an economy and they support like active government intervention and then you have the austrian school and they oppose this. They oppose the manipulation of money um, by central banks and governments, and because they argue it leads to like booms and busts. And they advocate for like commodity-based currencies and minimal government intervention. I do not have an economics background, and ever since like I started diving more into like finance and economics, you know, when uh, from when I was in in Bitcoin. Just like the Austrian school made so much more sense to me because it's very rational and it believes in human desires and human action, where I think like Keynesian economics for me is very, it's like ruler driven, like, you know, we agreed to do this and we put a, a signature on this. So now you can trust us or something like it does. It's, it, there's no rational arguments there. But I wanted to ask you, can you elaborate a bit? on these economic schools, how you view them, and why we are still stuck in a Keynesian uh, economics world instead of moving to, I think, what I and a lot of Bitcoiners think is a more sensible approach to economics. Yeah, as you know, I'm not an economist myself, um, but some 20 plus years ago, I started to read a lot of economics. Uh, I tried uh, some of the tra- standard textbooks uh, which are being used um, on the universities um, in the economics courses. 
found it difficult for, for, for me to understand it because uh, basically it was too much uh, mathematics and I'm not very good at mathematics, I have to admit. And um, I, I, I really felt that uh, it made, it made uh, sense to me. It wasn't uh, intuitive to understand uh, uh, those textbooks. I tried to le- read both uh, macroeconomics and uh, microeconomics and uh, found it really hard. Then I discovered uh, a man who is named Ronald Coase. He has um, he has, um won the the prize in member of Alfred Nobel some years ago. I, I wonder if it was in the 90s or something like that. And Ronald Coase, he wrote uh, a lot about uh, property rights, uh, things that uh, made uh, quite a lot of sense to me. And then uh, I started reading uh, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand... Um, she is a philosopher, but she understood quite a lot of economics, and it turned out that she had learned uh, economics from uh, Ludwig von Mises himself, and uh, that led me to Austrian economics. So around 2003 or something like that, I uh, started to discover Ronald Coase, no, not Ronald Coase, but uh, Murray Rothbard and uh, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, and you know these guys, they 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 write not only about um, uh, the mechanisms uh, involved in in economics, but uh, they have a very broad view. Um, they link it together with history, and um, yeah, it's it feels like uh, you know it's it's really a social science uh, and uh, much less uh, mathematics, uh, m- mostly argumenting from arguing from sort of first principles. Um, point of view so the the method was really different and um yeah if we if we just jump forward to to, to fraud coin when i wrote fraud coin uh, it was launched in 2022 i thought uh, i i will have to to talk a little bit about the differences between uh, keynesian economics uh, and uh, austrian school um and <laughs> What, 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 what's most important is to understand that there, there was a change in the way of thinking about economics in around 1920s um, when suddenly the natural sciences um, it, 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 you know that was on the back of a period of a whole lot of technical progress and innovation and so on. And I, I think that people really strongly believed in the natural sciences then and that you would find all the answers there. So they, they tried to implement it into also the social sciences using statistics and a sort of a laboratory way of thinking on uh, economic uh, problems. Um, and then they started to also become quite uh, a, a lot of uh, quite in. I think that they became influenced by the idea of the state trying to plan uh, the economy. And this was probably a direct result uh, of uh, the <laughs> what happened in the Soviet Union with the revolution they had there and. Uh, uh, they started to to yeah have a an ex, this extreme level of central planning in the in the ec- economy, and they probably spewed out um, uh, a lot of false statistics, uh, trying to sort of um, impress the Western countries and the rest of the world with uh, how successful they were and. Uh, it seems it really seems to me that um, many of the economists and yeah the universities became they were influenced by this way of thinking and they were they didn't manage to to see through the lies that came out of Kreml um, because it, it, you know it was it was purely propaganda um, and. Um, I also describe in fraud coin 
how this came about, how this change came about due to the influence that came from um, the Rockefeller Foundation because they started to um, provide finance, fi- financial aid, for instance, to the University of uh, Oslo. So the university in Oslo was able to to set up an economics um, department, which was fully financed by the the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, sort of the statutes uh, of of the foundations, um, yeah, of the fund, it said that um, they had to get rid of uh, the old way of thinking in economics and the social sciences. And uh, focus a lot more uh, on uh, yeah using real science, you know, uh, like um, uh, using the methods from the natural sciences with the testing and using statistics and uh, yeah using the state uh, more or less as a as a as a lab. Hey there! Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I just really want to ask you for a quick favor. Over the last few months, I've seen that only 75% of people who listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube are actually subscribed. The most important thing I'm currently focusing on next to hopefully giving you interesting conversations is growing this podcast subscriber base so I can continue with it into the future. I want to thank everyone who has been viewing and listening to Bitcoin for Millennials, leaving comments here and sending me DMs. It's been super, super motivating. So thank you so much. So I really want to ask you to please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or follow me on your favorite podcasting app if you are enjoying this podcast. Thanks again for joining me on this journey. Now back to the conversation. But is that still how they use it? Like, (laughs) yeah, it's it's for me, it feels like they, they try to model human behavior they try to put human behavior in certain mm. buckets or something in a sense right like they try to influence the the behavior and sorry to interrupt but i did I, like my thought is also like i don't know all this history for example right it's just if you look at it from an objective point of view it feels like you at least for me, should have people pick and choose what they want to spend money on or what they want to produce or create, you know, like the human incentives of making money or earning a reward to pay for your life are in my mind already enough, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah it seems like that is kind of like out of the picture in a sense. So basically, it, it's just uh, it just uh, corrupted the whole sub whole subject of economics uh, in in a very short period of time, because one one should be surprised at all by the fact that the politicians favor this new way of uh, teaching economics, because it uh, gave uh, the state uh, the government a uh, a much bigger role in 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 the economics uh, subject and uh, sort of um, they, they probably appreciated a lot that uh, the state should have a leading role you know guiding the rest of the society um, yeah being someone being an institution that should uh, promote progress uh, by scientific uh, uh sort of uh, using a more scientific type of economics and also all the power that uh, followed with the, this kind of thinking it, it, of course they supported uh, this transition so it it didn't go many it didn't take many decades before they basically wiped out the Austrian School of Economics and, and their influence on on on, on uh, this subject. And uh, uh, I think they were mar- 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 marginalized already before the the the, the Second World War. And um, I think this this has continued all the way up to uh, until perhaps the beginning of uh, this millennium uh, just yeah i think the austrian school got a revival uh, perhaps a little bit before uh, the f- uh, great financial crisis in 2008 so and and since then uh, it it has been a, a much more positive uh, development so previously people didn't 
have any idea what Austrian economics was uh, about uh, at all. And now these days, you know, uh, even uh, fighters on the U- UFC <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> talk about uh, <laughs> talk about yeah. uh, Ludwig von Mises. So, yeah, it it makes me very positive at least. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's very interesting to to see. So if we dive into that a bit, you know, uh, we just talked before we started recording. You know, like it it seems like lots of people have heard about inflation they also feel it in a sense i told you like that if i talk to my friends some say like oh yeah it just got a bit more expensive but they don't really think about it other people really notice it but they don't they don't spend time to study like what is happening they i don't know they just think it's part of it i don't actually know and know what they what they think but they don't they don't see the problem i think as i do you know they really don't care to dive in and and understand how it influences their life how would you um define inflation in in simple terms what do you what, how do you do that in the book hmm. so it it has been a lot of discussions on what the proper definition of inflation is and uh, i'm not interested in uh, semantics at all uh, i think we, we have to talk about the reality it makes it so much uh, yeah, fruitful the discussions. So I just say in the book that uh, I define inflation in the following way. You have monetary inflation, which is an increase in the money supply, increase, uh, so you grow the, the stock of money. And then you have uh, price inflation, which is a general price increase, you know, that most prices uh, uh, go up. And uh, then I say in fraud coin that uh, you have a sort of a causality here so if you in order to have a general price inflation over time you depend on an expansion of the money supply uh, the monetary inflation and it's it's as simple as that uh, it's it's nothing else than the monetary inflation that uh, explains the price inflation in in uh, over longer longer periods of time yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. So the more units of the currency you create, the less each unit um, is worth. has in value, the more units you have to ask for the same thing. Yeah. All right. So and what, what sparked your interest in this topic? Why did you decide to write a book about it? And, and like what the, about the effects on, on society? First of all, I realized many years ago that this is probably the most important of all political topics. Um, if you can tr- control the money supply and create money out of nothing, you can win almost every b- battle against uh, the others, those who cannot enjoy controlling the money printer. It's, it's very basic, um, actually. Uh, and I think probably I realized that people need to to understand this. Uh, if this is the most uh, important uh, political subject subject of of them all, then and people don't understand, it, we we don't learn about it in schools. Uh, even economics uh, students uh, learn almost nothing about it, and uh, uh, there's a whole lot of. Uh, false uh, ideas uh, being promoted about uh, monetary policy in the economics uh, textbooks and uh, also the financial um, students they don't very learn very much about it so so I, I thought this was the first time i wrote about this was in back in 2008 when we had the great financial crisis and uh, very few people understood what the causes were and they didn't understand the impact or, or uh, didn't understand how the, the way the central banks and, and the governments tried to deal with the uh, financial crisis, how that would affect uh, the economy and, uh, and politics in the long term. So that was the first time I, I wrote about it in an op-ed for a regional newspaper here in uh, Norway. 
And when uh, we came to 2022 and um, the price inflation started to uh, speed up uh, in the Western world and then uh, in the rest of the world as well, I thought perhaps I could expand on that upward um, and uh, and uh, write an, a pamphlet or something about it. I showed the pamphlet to a friend of mine. He said this is going to be one of the most important books in Norway if you if you if you make a book out of it and um, and he turned out to be right so I think what made it much easier for people to understand it uh, based on my presentation of the topic uh, was that I back in uh, 2008 uh, discovered how uh, this transition happened in Norway from monetary freedom to monetary monopoly and that happened in 1050, towards the very end of the Viking Age. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, well described in the royal sagas and also in some other sources uh, with some dramatic events um, uh, with real people, with the real names. And uh, uh, so it's sort of... And so what what happened there? I saw I saw that part <laughs> in the book, but you go yes. back. How long ago is the Viking Age? So the Viking Age ended in uh, one thousand and sixty six after Christ, and um, <laughs> yeah, I've expanded on uh, on that uh, also in in my latest book in Anbar, and uh, will write uh, we I, I write more even more about it in Arrow of Truth because uh, I think it's important to understand the transition. So what happened, if, if I just go a little f- bit further back, what happened towards the yeah, end of uh, the ninth century, um, the kings, they wanted to Christianize Norway. They wanted everybody to, to be baptized and accept uh, Christianity and uh, just give up their old religion. Uh, the old religions, they were, you know, they, they worshipped the, the Norse gods uh, like Thor and Odin and oh, yeah, a whole lot of gods. And, and then everything with regards to religion was decentralized. Uh, it was decentralized in, in terms of they had many gods. Uh, they worshipped uh, their gods. Uh, on the farms, not in big ch- churches or in, uh, in any centralized place. It was sort of the the, um, the landowner or the farmer him, himself who, who led the rituals. Uh, and uh, so everything was decentralized. And then the kings, they wanted probably to use religion as a political tool. So they wanted to have them believe in one god and uh, the kings they wanted to be sort of uh, their religious leader in their respective countries so in the beginning they tried to convince the norwegians about adopting uh, christianity voluntarily but uh, especially my people in the middle part of norway uh, which is called trøndelag they didn't accept this new religion and uh, in 995, uh, a king named Olav Tryggvason started to force uh, the new religion upon them by yeah, Christian christening them by by sword, uh, so to speak, and uh, kidnapped the sons of uh, the most powerful farmers uh, around here and kept them hostage uh, and. Uh, over time, they they succeeded more and more in uh, in convincing the people that they had to give up their old old uh, religion, and in parallel, they tried to introduce uh, uh, monopoly in coinage. So they produced uh, coins with the with the king's symbol uh, on one hand and the uh, Christian cross on 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 the on the other side of the coin. Uh, but they didn't succeed in doing this. Uh, they were the first king, Olav Tryggvason, who tried this, he was uh, killed in a battle in, I think it was in year 1000. 
and then uh, later uh, another king came and he was uh, chased out of uh, the country by the farmers uh, mm. and the people uh, who lived there uh, he came back in 1030 uh, he also had tried to introduce uh, monopoly and coinage and uh, he yeah, christianized people by uh, using sword violence coercion so he was killed in 1030 but at that time uh, the people they were really tired of uh, this uh, battle battle against uh, christianity and uh, the pressure was uh, too, too, too it was too much for them to bear so they just accepted Christ- christianity and when a new King Harald Hardrada, he is known as uh, the late, the last uh, Viking king. Uh, when he took power as a sole sovereign in uh, 1047, uh, then uh, most of the country had been, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they had converted. Most people had converted to Christi- Christianity, and he. Um, promoted himself as the sole leader of the of the of the, of the church he was sort of above uh, the church itself and then he started to introduce uh, monopoly and coinage we don't know the exact year but we think uh, he perhaps tried to to start uh, a little bit before 1050 but he didn't succeed in uh, implementing his scheme until after he had managed to kill the, the most powerful uh, man in Norway. He lived in, in my region here. Uh, he was, his name was Einar Tambarselve. So he killed him and then he set out to, to force his, uh, enforce his uh, monopoly and uh, exploit, exploited the people. So he... He probably tripled uh, the money supply in uh, in less than 16 years, and he did it to to finance the battle against the uh, Danish king. He wanted to reclaim the uh, control over Denmark because Denmark has had been uh, um, sort of a part of the Norwegian Empire in uh, before 1047. And what happened then actually was that the, the, when the Danish king saw that uh, Harald Hardrada financed uh, his warring against Denmark with uh, the monetary uh, policy, basically almost creating money out of nothing uh, with his, uh, with his uh, silver coin scheme, um, yeah, Harald Hardrada, he forced everybody to use uh, his uh, coins so people had to come to his mint and uh, give uh, their silver to his mint and uh, the, the, the mint gave uh, some coins back to them but they didn't uh, include all of the silver that uh, the mint had uh, received so it was sort of a silver tax uh, that they, the mint could use to, to produce uh, coins for, for the king so what most likely happened was that the Danish king understood that he, in order for him to defend himself, he would have to do exactly the same thing in Denmark against his own people. So we know that um, the first uh, debasement of uh, Danish coins uh, happened around uh, it could have been 1056, 1057 or something like that when the war was going on with Norway. But they they managed to 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 cut a peace deal. Uh, I think it was towards the end of the 1050s, and then um, uh, this ambitious king uh, Harald Hardrada. He was an evil tyrant. He he turned his attention to to England and wanted to conquer England. And in 1066, he he tried to do that unsuccessfully. And he, he, he lost uh, about 5,000 men and, and was killed uh, himself uh, as well in uh, the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Wow. The famous battle there. So it's, it's a very dramatic history and uh, it's important to understand the link between uh, the belief system uh, and, and which religion is a part of and, um, and, uh, and the monetary policy. It's also one thing I didn't mention. It was that 
Her in Trøndelag vi hadde what we call the resistance provisions, which meant that uh, a king who wanted to increase the taxes, he would have to uh, get a green light and acceptance uh, for that from, from the local, the regional thing uh, where the yeah where the farmers and those who had uh, who owned uh, land uh, they they were the ones in power there so if they didn't, didn't accept his proposal they, then he wouldn't be able to increase the taxes and and the law actually said that if the king took someone's property without uh, having got a green light from the frosta thing then uh, they were obliged to uh, to try to kill him. Everybody were obliged to try to kill him. All uh, of the people in Trøndelag were obliged to try to kill him. And if they were, weren't successful in doing that, they were obliged to, to chase him out of the country. And this is probably a tradition which has been in place in Trøndelag, in my area, for I, I would guess for thousands of years. And I suspect, but we don't know much about it, I think this is this has been the same principle almost all over the world before mm. we got uh, centralized institutions like the state. Um, so, and you know, it's it's like uh, it's like a, a general conscription in in uh, service of the people themselves instead of uh, uh, conscription in, in service of of the state. Uh, it's it's the very opposite of the system we have today, and uh, this was probably uh, a fundamental part of the belief system that they had uh, at that time. They understood that if they uh, gave an inch to a king, they would lose it all. Mm. So when we come to 1050, and uh, everybody or most people are. They have been baptized, they believe in Christianity, they see a ruthless king who's also the sole leader of the of the religion. And then it's probably much harder for 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 for, for the people to 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 sort of um, uh, agree with each other that they are they will have to go after the king and kill him. You know, in accordance with the Christian religion, perhaps they thought that they would end up in hell instead of being uh, heroes as they would have been uh, under the previous uh, type of belief system. Yeah. So the belief system changed uh, dramatically over just a period of just 60 years or something like that. And in the same period, uh, two kings first then tried to introduce monopoly and coinage, and then a third king came. Uh, and yeah, just uh, were able to to, to su- succeed uh, with with that mon- monetary policy scheme. And after that, we have had almost a, a one thousand years of inflation as a policy in Norway. And that's uh, that's the reason why that is the, the subtitle of my book: One Thousand Years with Inflation as a Policy. Yeah, so many things to unpack here. But I think <laughs> what I yeah. find interesting is that if you have a sole leader. And they look for control of the coinage, right? Of the money, basically, to one, you know, get more for themselves. You know, they create more for themselves than they uh, than they mint, basically, or what the people what the people trade in. I think that's that's one. But then you also have a vehicle to tax to tax people, right? For from their productivity, basically. So you work for the king, but what does the king do for you? And there I find it interesting, like uh, what you said. I, I, for me, it makes a lot of sense that that there was like this super transparent agreement in a sense, right? Like, okay, you rule over us, um, but you are accountable to su- such and such degree, right? Like that is also a little sidestep, but I like that. I don't know if you watched uh, Peaky Blinders. But yes, I what, love that series. It's, what I love um, about it is that, favorites. you know, this is early, early 1920s. Everyone is violent. Everyone has a gun, right? But they're not shooting each other constantly. It's about, you know, if, if you and I make a deal and we spit in our hand and we shake each other's hand, we both know that if I try to 
mess with you, right? If I don't want to uphold my end of the deal, I accept that you can shoot me. And you see that multiple times in the show, right? Like, and also that they do try to mess with each other, but then, you know, eventually they get killed. And of course, it's very brutal, right? We don't want to start shooting people in the street, which is horrible, of course. But like the transparency of the agreement in, like, in, in that era always really fascinated me because it's just very clear, mm. right? We can be mutually beneficial or I can try to mess mess up whatever we agree you know but then i'm also in big trouble right so it's a very conscious choice to either conform to our agreement or hmm. try to mess with you but then i'm also you know 100 percent okay with the consequences it's a very conscious decision right and i think your example of the king i think it's kind of the same right if the, if that rule of that everyone is obligated to then kill the king you know if he messes with the citizens you know if that is very clear to everyone including the king then perhaps it's fine that there is some sort of hierarchy, but there is a check, checks and balances type of of mm. situation, right? So that's kind of what I had to think about. But if we if we put this to like the current time, one thing I think about is like you talk about the past, right? This is a thousand years ago. People were, uh, you know, barbarics and stuff like that. That's kind of how we think about the past. I think, right? And a lot of times when we think about the past, you know, uh, kings tried to control the coins so they got richer, right? I mean, it's even in Game of Thrones, for example, right? Like the the Lannisters, they own the bank, right? And they own the money, whatever. But like a lot of people look at how certain rulers in the current day rule, but they they don't connect that to the history, kind of. Like mm. it feels like the history is far away it's fiction you know like it it doesn't happen like that where you know a thousand mm. years ago the people that lived then were exactly the same as us right with the same wants and needs and virtues and flaws and all and all these things right so mm. how i think about that is like these people are no different like that 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 system is no different right and it would make a lot of sense that you would pitch your citizens why you want to raise taxes, what you're going to spend it on, how it benefits their lives before they actually start giving you money. Um, I would also like to think about this, you know, if the leaders of now can just create money, why do we pay taxes? <laughs> you know, like I think that's <laughs> such a funny, a funny thought. But like, what do you think, what do you think is like the biggest lesson we can take out of that story? Maybe that, nothing ever really changes mm. and we are we are perhaps in a in the same situation or yeah okay i think the, the most important thing is uh, how we how we frame this from an analytical perspective because we see that the monetary freedom that they had until about 1050 it was safeguarded uh, on the basis or it was safeguarded by a belief system uh, where everybody were obliged to fight against the king and nobody could be a free rider if you were a free rider you threatened the whole system because it would infect all the others who wanted to fight but who saw that someone tried to not join the fight so it to me that's one of the most important lessons that people understood that they would have to fight together and and also that nobody nobody would do the fighting for them mm. you couldn't you couldn't leave it to others to provide your security you had to fight for it yourself you you, you couldn't rely on anyone else to safeguard your freedom you had everybody would have to join the fight that's that's sort of a, a fundamental way of thinking yeah uh, a, a very core a core value of the society and once you sort of leave that kind of thinking and start to say that 
well, perhaps it's good that we have a king that can, can take care of us, that can protect it, uh, protect us against the foreign enemies, etc. Then perhaps I, I will have to accept that he taxes me, although I don't want to pay his taxes that much. Yeah. And perhaps I will have to accept that he monopolizes the money production that uh, you get this royal privilege in well because you choose you chose not to fight right that's yes. then the consequence i find so, it interesting so you have a mm, you have a, yeah. a a very close link between the belief system and the monetary system so i i call the belief system layer 0 and the monetary system layer 1 and the reason why the monetary system is layer one is that you get such a different civilist type of civilization or society with a monetary system based on the principle of monetary freedom compared to a monetary system based on monopoly. So once you understand that all those other layers in society uh, will develop in very different ways depending on what type of monetary system you have. You see that um, the analytical framework should be, or at least uh, at least a sort of the rough idea with my analytical framework is that it all starts with the belief system and mm. then then you get the monetary system, and then the, the rest of the the, the society, society depends uh, develops depending on on, on the monetary system. Yeah. Because what happens if you monopolize the mon money production? Uh, the first, the very first thing that a king will uh, spend his money on is more weapons, and then he will also hire more soldiers and once he is able to have more soldiers a bigger army more weapons then immediately it becomes so much easier to increase the taxes to force the will upon the people and in addition of course the king will corrupt the society by hiring people and making deals with merchants etc so he, he, he sort of builds up slowly a support based on his spending of the money and there's what we see today is that there is no end in how much they uh, will expand uh, increase the taxes for instance in Norway now we we have a public sector that spends almost two thirds of uh, the GDP. Oh, really? So it, it, yeah, oh. it's enormous. I, I guess if you if you account for uh, the black market in the Soviet Union, I think it would be something uh, similar nowadays in Norway because the black market was really huge in Soviet Union, and uh, that country wouldn't have functioned at all with, with without that large uh, black market. So. Yeah, it, it begins with the with the belief system, and then you get the monetary system, and then uh, the rest of society develops uh, in in accordance with what time type of monetary system you have. So that pretty much sums up why I think it's so important to understand uh, uh, inflation, where it comes from, and what the root cause is, uh, because. We can't expect we can't expect that we will be able to do anything with this problem if we don't understand the root cause of the problem. So many Bitcoin. Perhaps we should switch to Bitcoin now a little bit because many Bitcoiners seem to think that stacking sets uh, that's sufficient. That's sort of a way of fighting against the the enemy, against the state. Uh, but I, I don't think it's uh, sufficient. If we are going to succeed with our project, we should view Bitcoin as a very useful instrument, uh, a tool, uh, a weapon, if you, if you want. But uh, we have to work with the belief system of the people. 
Yeah. We have to make people understand that if you are a free rider or if you leave it to others to fight your cause, fight for your freedom, then you will never be free. You can't just trust that a monetary technology will, will set you free automatically. Yeah. That's that's never going to happen in in my uh, in my view at, uh, at least. Yeah. Well, before we move on to to Bitcoin, I I wanted to reflect on what you just said because that was one thing that made me think of Bitcoin. You know, like what you said, if there are no free riders, or there were no free riders back in the day, right? Everyone agreed to the rule of fighting against the king because everyone agreed to the rule. To fight against the king, basically, hmm. right? You kn- you knew that everyone agreed, therefore you agreed, kind of. Hmm. I feel the same thing in Bitcoin, like when you think about the rules of Bitcoin, right? Like, um, and I've said this over and over again. Like, I think anyone listening to this who is studying Bitcoin, etc., you don't have to trust any person that talks on this podcast. Not me, not you, not anyone. The, the fact that you can verify everything about how bitcoin works that's the entire point of bitcoin it's extremely transparent and open and you can look up any rules any code anything basically and then you can decide to participate in it and when you decide to participate in it which is you know it's um how do you say it's it's voluntarily a decision instead of being ruled, you know, by force, <laughs> by a mm. king, for example. And I think when you say king, it's just the ruler of the country, whether your country, you know, has a king currently uh, or not. But I think that voluntary choice of using Bitcoin as money and therefore also following the rules of Bitcoin, that signals to other people that it's a trustworthy thing, in my opinion, right? Mm. Because it's so is so open i mean uh you know in 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 the book you talk about how our financial system is based on trust right that's also what the uh, economists say right they say it's built on actu- trust actually i i argue against that statement in the book um, because i say that the the foundation for for the monetary system that we have today is uh, first of all two things uh, not trust, but uh, coercion mm-hmm. and deception. Yeah, I say coercion uninformed. Deception. I say uninformed, forced trust. <laughs> you know, it's not optional. <laughs> yeah, a, yeah, you know, it's not that's optional. It's of... dictated, right? Mm. And I think mm. to go back to your beginning, like how I learned about economics in high school. Again, after that, not it was all about calculating stuff, right? And I've talked to. Uh, also on the podcast with a lot of uh, people who are in economics. I think one episode is with Leon Wang Kum. He's a master of economics. And he told me, I never learned what money is in my entire study, <laughs> you know. And so it's not weird that people just conform to whatever the money is, right? Like I have a young son. I give him coins. He goes to a store. He gets a thing. Yeah, okay. You know, like that That works. Mm. So you you never really trust it but later if you reflect upon it like did you ever choose the money that you use no you mm-hmm. know and do you understand how it works also no are there people who benefit from the creation of the money uh, and you don't that's correct you know like all these things mm. sound crazy to a lot of people but they they are true you know and i i i'm just so fascinated by the following question is why don't more people question this? Like, why? Why? And 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 there, maybe to add to that, also to what you just said, I feel it's sometimes really like a spiritual type of thing, right? It's like how good do we know ourselves, right? If we do business and I do something for you, that's you trusting me. That's me spending my time. That's me spending my energy. Me, maybe you know, um, how do you say? actually building an idea i have for you i don't know a house or you know whatever like it's it's a connection between two people this a value exchange right but that's influenced by the thing we use to represent the value that's influenced by people that don't care that 
you are you and I am me, you know, and I, I feel that this is such a huge thing. Like, what do you spend your finite amount of time on of your life, you know, and how are you rewarded for that? Hmm. And, and people just don't really think about it, but I wanted to ask your opinion on it. Like, why, why, why don't people do that? Uh, it's probably many reasons, but of course, is you know I've been going to attending school and university for a total of eighteen years, and I didn't le learn a shit about uh, money, just like most people who have uh, a lot of education. So you don't learn about uh, about it, about how important it is, the monetary system, how, how important money is to to the people. Then, uh, but we learn uh, a ton about other things that uh, they tell us are important, you know, uh, which, uh, for instance, polit politics in general, that we have to be active, uh, actively participating in the democr democracy, the democratic processes, etc., that we should uh, read the newspapers. That's, uh, that was very important in, uh, in, uh, when we went to school. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's probably more about uh, being used to talk about all the other things than money. Mm. And then you have two other aspects of it. I think, uh, first of all, at least in this part of the Western world, uh, money is sort of seen as the root of all evil. And if it's the root of all evil, then you rather don't want to talk about it because it's a, a negative thing. It's just money is something that you just need. I don't want to learn more about it. I, I need money. I earn money. I save a little bit of money. It's it's okay. I don't want to learn about it. It's, it's almost yeah. like you don't want to learn too much about rats either. You, everybody hates rats. You don't want, want to talk about it. You don't want to learn about it. And then the, the third thing is um, um, if you try to understand where money comes from and monetary policy, then what should you do about the knowledge you get? It's a sort of an external thing, something that most people would think they can't do anything about it. It's just it just exists. It's a policy. It's been there for one thousand years. How can I do anything to affect that? It's like the weather. It just appears. Today it's sunny. Yesterday it was raining. It's an uh, what do you call it? An exogenic factor or something yeah. like that. In uh, yeah, but so, isn't that the the layer zero you talked about? Also, also in connection what I just said, like the instead of ag agreeing as a group to follow certain rules or what we agree to, it's kind of like people outsourced their responsibility yes. over their life. They are totally okay with it. And mm. then, you know, it's easy. So they don't question it. Is that then Probably, maybe the yes. layer zero <laughs> that, that we live money, on? Yeah, like the idea is, might be for some people that money is too complex. We better leave it to the experts. Other can handle this, take care of monetary policy things uh, in a way that uh, helps my, uh, is, is good for my life. I expect that they will do that. I, yeah. I'm not supposed to be uh, responsible for looking into that. I leave it to others. Yeah, that's uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. That's mm. also why I said sp a spiritual thing, right? Because then it's kind of like again the example of me doing something for you. We have a value exchange. That is just you and me in all freedom. You know, we can pick and choose whoever we have. Uh, a value exchange with, but then a third party influences the the reward that is exchanged there, right? Or the quality of the work that is done, therefore, as, as well. And I think that is what I then mean about like outsourcing that responsibility. Like you know, something influences your life, but you you decide to be ignorant 
and look away because it's easier you know for me that's more like a spiritual thing that's really like a matrix thing right if you know <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. it, it is different but you decide to ignore it but that also gives you a hard life i'd say it's you know the easy choice hard life uh, uh, thing because mm. you cannot really complain about it then maybe you have to fight it but then well you get to that kind of crossing point to okay i uh how do you say like uh gave my responsibility away my whole life and now uh, i have to fight you know like that sounds very yeah. da- very daunting you know <laughs> so hmm. i mean I, I i do get it that a lot of people don't study it i mean i didn't study it for uh, the first uh, 30 years of my life so I mean, that's hmm. uh, that's also hmm. the case so what how how do you see bitcoin playing a role in like future monetary policies do you think it could help combat you know bad policies that create inflation how how Mm. how does bitcoin prove that you can trust you know its monetary policy Mm. you know i i come from the angle that i i analyze money the monetary system monetary policy uh, from a sort of a social point of view not a technological point of view Uh, many people start with the question what is money and they dive into how different types of money developed over time and that silver and gold uh, sort of won the battle became the most popular commodity money and then fiat money just sort of happened to be a better technology so to speak and Mm it naturally led to where we are today and perhaps that also naturally uh, led to the, the development of uh, private uh, privately created digital currencies and then in the end uh, bitcoin as a sort of a very promising freedom technology and, and monetary technology but the way i see it as is uh, that uh, just like silver coins gold coins bitcoin is uh, really it's it's like a fundamentally neutral matter it's it's a dead thing it only is brought into life uh, when we humans start to use it when we start to understand it so all the value that we will get out of bitcoin will come from the way we use bitcoin the way we think about bitcoin the way we talk about bitcoin the way we let bitcoin influence us uh, uh, philosophically with, with regard also to how we try to use it to understand and uh, perhaps improve our values so i think i think bitcoin develops 100% on the social layer mm. and that's also why I, when i discovered bitcoin uh, just before i launched uh, fraudcoin uh, in 2022 uh, i was fascinated by the social layer of bitcoin that was the main thing that caught my eye that I saw that I shared the, the same values as the Bitcoin maxis. I felt really at home from a philosophical perspective. And I saw that I immediately, I immediately understood that that's where the growth is going to come from. People understand it and want to uh, make other people understand it. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> what strikes me is that we have this fantastic technology and it, it really attracts attracts the best and the brightest of people. It's like a it's like a torch in the dark. It glows and uh, people just they want to understand what this is. Yeah. And uh, it just grows and grows and uh, so my my idea is that if we work hard together and try to embody some of the older values 
uh, which were prevalent when we had monetary freedom, that will help us to make this social layer of Bitcoin grow. And by doing that, make Bitcoin become more, much more valuable and much more quickly. But if we don't understand the connection between the um, belief system and the monetary system, then we'll, we'll lose speed compared to a situation where we do understand it. Yeah. So how would you define the current belief system then? <laughs> I talked about this when I visited uh, what Bitcoin did podcast and uh, talked to Peter McCormick and uh, I said that uh, we have seen a transition from people believing in themselves to people believing in Christian religion, one God. We were became very religious over a period of many, many centuries. And then people started to believe in the state. So the state has become sort of a religion mm -hmm. uh, by itself. And it has pretty much uh, replaced uh, Christianity in the Western world as a religion. Yeah. This is uh, sounds very, very dark, of course. But the state has expanded uh, so at such a dramatic speed, and now people start to understand more and more people start to understand that there's something fundamentally wrong with the system today. Yeah. So I think at, at this moment in time, people are very ready, very sort of receptive to the idea that we have to look uh, in. Back, back in time and, and try to understand the traditions we had and how our belief system uh, shaped uh, society back then. I think people understand, uh, more and more people understand that uh, actually they had a, quite a good life back then. Uh, they didn't have all those technologi technologies um, that we have today, uh, everything that we take for granted today. But they lived a very he healthy life. Um, at least most people in my area here in Trendlag. And just by coincidence, I discovered the meaning of Trønder. Trønder, that's the, the people, my people, we are called Trønders. Oh, wow. And I read, I read about it in an article uh, just a few months ago. It means uh, fertile and strong. And this cool. hasn't been, this hasn't been, taught in, in our schools. Not at all. We have, haven't heard anything, anything about it. What, what sort of what is my people? It was shocking to me. Yeah. And al also at the same time I, I felt pride. I felt very proud of sort of discovering what this was all about. Perhaps some 1000 years ago when we were powerful and fought back against evil kings and fought together and uh, probably they had a very good life here uh, yeah we we have all the resources we need here in Trøndelag we have rivers we have woods it's uh, the, the 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 soil is very fertile uh, we can grow everything we need here uh, we know we don't need the rest of norway we don't we don't need the rest of the world we have everything we need here yeah. And we protected our resources uh, very effectively uh, 1,000 years ago. Yeah. Well, so, you know, no, I think yeah. if we are able to rediscover what we had perhaps a long time ago, I think, I think it will be exactly the same in the Netherlands where you live. If you look back in time, uh, for instance, the re revolt in 1566, when you reintroduced uh, monetary freedom in the Netherlands and you, you got the golden age. I write about this also in, the, in Fraudcoin. It, when you understand how much that meant to you to rediscover monetary freedom, yeah. uh, it, it sort of helps a lot uh, to, yeah, to spread the word about Bitcoin and, uh, as well, I think. It's, it's a, it might be better to promote Bitcoin indirectly in my experience 
and talk about uh, the positive things with monetary freedom and the bad things about monetary uh, monopoly and how uh, the latter affects uh, society and then sort of introduce uh, Bitcoin as a possible uh, tool which can and, uh, let us um, win back monetary freedom in the end. Yeah, That's, that's a better approach, uh, at least from my, my, what my experience is uh, when I talk to, to people who don't uh, understand anything about money or, or Bitcoin or anything like that. Yeah. Do you think we are like we are far away from that like for me this what you just said i think it's very hopeful right it's very positive view of what people together can do um again kind of like the spiritual angle but i think lots of people are very very nihilistic these days like uh <laughs> things things don't work it's all bad i cannot influence this etc you know without understanding that well, maybe it mm. was an unconscious choice choice for for most but for some also definitely a conscious choice to to ignore right but but to get to this hopeful part and future outlook you first have to accept that you are in you know a dark a dark part of well, <laughs> dark dark part of time i think you know and that's hard for people so they rather say like well i can just uh, you know i cannot change this or you know <laughs> whatever like mm -hmm. you know the nihilistic outlook like how far do you feel like we are away from this very far or not too far like no, what? no? I, I i'm i'm very optimistic but of course i'm being sort of colored by my own uh journey here because i didn't discover bitcoin before 2022 very very late unfortunately um there are many reasons for that but um after the bitcoin community embraced fraud coin uh and i found a sort of family there um things have been moving very quickly for me, so my change, uh, my my life has has changed dramatically just in a period of one and a half year. So, for instance, I had never been on a podcast before uh, November twenty twenty two, and now I I've, I've been guesting I think thirty seven podcasts or something like that. Nice. Yeah, and I've been invited to to give presentations in the, and participating in a pan, in panels in Madeira, you know, the Bitcoin Atlantis conference. I think you were there too, weren't you? Yeah, you were there this yeah. year. Oh, we missed each other. Yes. And uh, now uh, Matthias in, in Prague uh, invited me to give a, a keynote uh, presentation, or not keynote, but 20 minutes presentation on the main stage in Prague this uh, year in june and uh, so those those are big things for me to experience i'm i think many people are very receptive to the ideas that i promote and, and not only in the bitcoin community but now i surprisingly was invited to give uh, the key speech when we celebrate uh, constitution day on 17th of may uh, here in norway so I'm going to give the speech for my in my local community, and I'm going to talk to the children and the the youth, uh, especially there, about uh, uh, the relationship between the the constitution and the monetary policy. The central bank uh, was uh, sort of founded uh, uh, in in Norway, based on on the on the constitution, and people really, everybody in Norway uh, that <laughs> or not everybody, but but so many different. Uh, parts of, of Norway now wants me to talk about this. They are very receptive to this. Uh, many podcasts here in, in Norway they want to talk to me about this. And uh, so, I, and and what I bring to the table is is a is a positive idea. I think uh, I say that uh, if we can try to learn from our past, we will be able to win this battle. Mm. And then I say, I'm proud 
because I'm fighting this battle and I want you to fight too because it's the only right thing to do. If you don't fight, then you're by definition leaving it to others and uh, you're hoping that others will win the battle for you. Uh, then you're a free rider. It's yeah. it's simple as that. It's a choice you will have to make. It's up to you. So so people, <laughs> I've seen so many dramatic wake ups after they have written, uh, they have read my books or heard me speak, and they say that uh, Rune, you have changed the way I think of life. Um, so, so me being in, in sort of in the center of these uh, events, you know, I'm in the center of my life, and just like you are in the center of your life, and and uh, the, the the speed uh, that this uh, train that I am, am embarked upon uh, one and a half year ago, it it sort of um, yeah, it it's so it's so fast now. So yeah. I, I'm not objective, but uh, what I experience is is very it makes me very optimistic. I think I'm going to to uh, re- continue to be an optimist for for the rest of my life, and I, I don't see I don't see any other way out either. If if you are nihilistic or, or negative, you you are pessimistic. You you won't be able to to to, to make any change. Yeah. So I I don't feel that I have a choice. Yeah. And uh, we will be able to do this together if we stand together. Yeah, 100% agree. I do think, you know, of course, we should talk about the things that are not okay, but we do have an outlook, you know, as to how how we can change it. And uh, yeah, 100% align with what what you say. I think it's very, it feels very natural, at least for me. It seems also for you, you know, like to share how Bitcoin changed your view on the world or taught you new things or shows you you know how we can actually create a more positive and hopeful future and i think the the act of doing something whether it's writing a book or doing keynotes or making a podcast i think at least for me it came very natural it's not it's like i want to do this like i want to contribute to this because i see what this can be but i also understand you know, I don't like it when people say, you know, it's inevitable, etc. Like we have to, you know, we have to work for it, basically. Um, mm, mm. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's definitely, that's definitely what you're doing. So what, what would you say is like, what has been the biggest change in your world view because of Bitcoin? What, what's the biggest thing you, you change your mind about? That's a very good answer, and the answer uh, question and the answer is is so simple because I had almost given up when um, before before I I discovered the Bitcoin community and uh, meeting the Bitcoiners in person and also on the internet on Twitter other places and understanding that uh, there are so many people out there who uh, have the same values uh, as me and they want to to join the fight uh, to be the be sort of a force for good that was uh, a life changing ex- experience for me um it's it's probably it might be the most important thing that has uh, happened to me in my life um i imagine that a whole lot of other bitcoiners feel exactly the same mm. it's a um, it's very rewarding uh, and you also feel uh definitely feel a lot of gratitude i feel lucky to be alive at this moment yeah. um and Although I haven't been able to stack up uh, so much Bitcoin as I would like to, nobody, oh, everybody would like to have more Bitcoin, of course. But I've been working with books now for for three years. I haven't uh, been able to afford a lot of Bitcoin investments. But I, I feel 
more and more sort of based because I've uh, found uh, more reason in life. And that sort of calms me down a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have the I have the same. That calms me down. It's it's because I I think it's because you learn that you can actually trust yourself. Which mm. is like a really big thing, you know? And uh I don't know, like I feel uh I'll I'll, f- I'll figure it out or something, you know. It's, it's kind of the mm. the baseline approach, yeah. But like, if you don't mind me asking, what do you mean with like you you gave up? Like, what do you mean by that? What what changed? Okay, so I sort of between two thousand and two and two thousand and eight, nine, ten, or something like that. I, I really I I, I got some so much new knowledge and understanding by studying economics and the Austrian School of Economics and uh, trying to understand money. But I I was so alone. Uh, I didn't have anyone to talk to uh, about these issues here in Norway. And when I tried to talk about it uh, with friends and and family, they sort of shrugged their shoulders and uh, they didn't want to discuss these items. It was a nuisance, you know, now Rune, Rune is talking about these things again. Uh, they, yeah. So it was a sort of uh, yeah. It, it wasn't good at all. And uh, uh, then I, I had a personal experience in 2010, uh, which we don't have the time to talk about here now, but uh, I just gave up on being active and, and trying to to, to influence others uh, and I just gave up on uh, politics. I didn't follow the news for, for 10 years uh, uh, before uh, the pandemic broke out in, uh, in, uh, in 2020. So I, I had so many years there, there yeah, approximately 10 years when I went back to be a normie as someone who was just an ordinary citizen, you know, working as a lawyer, being a family man. Uh, being active in the, my bicycle, uh, my cycling club, uh, yeah, doing things like that, and never thinking about politics or money or anything like that, just earning and spending, and yeah, and so being and living a normal life. And then, uh, yeah, it, it was sort of um, it was it was very negative, of course, that we we had this big problem with the inflation from 2022, but uh, it inspired me to 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 start um, to 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 write about this uh, again. Then, so in from that, uh, yeah, that's the sort of the silver lining, uh, as they say in English. Yeah, um, yeah. So, mm. yeah. So, so, I I yeah. hear that the batteries in my head uh, earbuds uh, okay. are beginning to protest. So let's uh, let's wrap it up. Two questions. <laughs> what do you hope? The readers will take away from the book. I think I think uh, readers. Uh, th- this will be the the the, the first half of, of the orange pill. Uh, I think because I write only two pages about Bitcoin in the book, but but pe- and the. Uh, so I promote my, the conclusion in the book is that we should fight for monetary freedom, and that Bitcoin and also perhaps gold uh, could be sort of a, a, a very um, important tool for for people uh, in order to to uh, battle uh, the the consequences of inflation in their um, individual lives. Um, I, I think. I think it it can have an impact uh, both in Norway and uh, outside of Norway. It has been translated into English and uh, Polish and the uh, German versions are on, on their way as well. So um, I think it can have an impact uh, in terms of audience killing uh, many, many people. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, it the, the conclusion, or to conclude, I think when people read Bitcoin, they don't, they they won't only get a whole lot of new knowledge, but they will get a whole lot of new understanding of how uh, society works, and uh, a whole lot of uh, understanding of the importance of of the monetary system.
they will feel it because uh, I've uh, focused so much on presenting um, uh, real figures, you know, real people, um, and follow the, um, the development of monetary policy on on uh, the basis of uh, describing what real people did in this and that country. It sort of makes the whole history come alive. It's not a dry uh, theoretical uh, subject anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So, last question. And I ask everyone the same question What is a core belief you will never let go? I think. It must be that uh, freedom and sovereignty is something that it's not only worth fighting for, but you are morally obliged fighting for it. And uh, if you don't fight for it, then uh, everything else don't sort of make any sense to me, at least. Yeah. W without freedom and sovereignty, what's uh, what's uh, all the rest worth? Yeah. yeah. I agree. Thanks for sharing and thanks for this conversation. I will link to your online profiles and the book so people can check it out. And uh, yeah, man, let's keep in touch and perhaps we see each other at a conference in the future. Great. Thanks for having me, and uh, it's been a great. Uh, uh, it's been great talking to you. So, yeah, see you later. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at b r a m k. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.